Well, it's good to have all of you here and those of you who are online with us this morning as well as we uh, continue in our series from Experiencing God. And uh, we had a great first service this morning and uh, we wanted to re really focus on how we make adjustments in our life with God. So let me pray for us. Father, thank you Father, for these moments that we can come together this morning to worship you through song, uh, through some skits, even crafts, Lord, that to speak to us about the message today. And I just ask, Lord, that you would guide us and direct us and just help us understand this important concept that we are to make major adjustments in our life to join God in what he's doing uh, so that as we make these adjustments in our life, we obey you, and as a result, we, we see the goodness and grace and blessing of God through it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. When I was younger, I was always amazed at certain kinds of athletes who had great flexibility. I mean, gymnasts, right, and different people. And I'm, even as a grandfather, I, I notice my grandchildren are just much more flexible than I am. See, growing up, I had what was called husky clothing. Now, I don't know if you remember this or not, but in the 60s, early 70s, they had what they called husky clothing. I was not a gymnast type. I was just a big kid. And so husky clothing was when your mother took you in to get some clothing, she would say, they'd ask, well, what size does he need? And she would always say, he needs husky clothing. Husky meant larger frame clothing. A big kid, right? One of the guys after the service said to me, he had husky slim clothing, whatever that meant. But I kind of liked husky clothing because it meant I was a bigger guy for my age, but I also liked husky dogs. So I thought, this is not a bad thing. But to be honest... I wasn't a gymnast type. Uh, I was more of a lacrosse hockey player type, football type, that was just a big kid, husky, not very flexible, right? And, and one of the things that we need to understand that every time God spoke to his people in the scriptures about something he wanted to do through them, significant Adjustments had to be made. You, you had to be flexible. They, ha they had to adjust their lives to God. And once the adjustments were made, God accomplished his purpose through them as they obeyed him. So over the last few weeks, we've been learning some important um, aspects or principles around knowing and doing the will of God. And these principles were, have been laid out for us. We have one more week to go. But God is always at work around us, as we saw in the first lesson, that God continues to uh, a, a love relationship with us that's real and personal in our everyday lives, and that God invites us to become involved in his work. And then, as we saw, God speaks. How does God speak to us? Well, he speaks to us by the Holy Spirit, through the scriptures, through prayer, circumstances, and the church and godly people to reveal his purposes, his will, and his ways to us. But God's invitation for us to come alongside him in his work leads us to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. And as we saw last week, as we used the kind of a corn maze uh, uh, symbol or illustration that when you're in the corn maze and you come to a fork in the road, you have to make a decision to go one way or the other. And every day in our lives, whether it's kind of micro decisions or major decisions in our life, uh, we have to understand we have a choice to make. We either go God's way or we go against the things of God and end up kind of going in circles in our life as a result. Now, the first turning point in knowing and doing the will of God was this crisis of belief, that you must believe God, who he says he is, what he will do, and what he says he will do. And without faith in God, you, you will make the wrong decision at this turning point in your life. Now, the second turning point for us to understand the will and the ways of God is that you must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he is doing. 
Adjusting your life to God is the second critical point. And making the adjustments of your life to God is also this turning point. If you choose to adjust to the things of God, you go on in obedience. But if you refuse to adjust, you can miss out on what God has in store for your life. So the question is, will we let the Lord mold us, shape us into the people he wants us to be so that he can work through us? Now, Jesus, in Luke chapter 9, if you turn there, this is the key verse that we're looking at this morning, or a couple of verses, for us to understand how important it is for us to adjust our life to God. Now, you can go online right now and get the notes for this service. They're extensive there. They're shorter here in the moments I have this morning. But um, all the scriptures and the outline is there for you. And, uh, and you can follow along there or take notes this morning or use those notes this afternoon to review what you've been learning. So Jesus says this in verse 23 of Luke 9. He says, uh, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self or soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Jesus not only gives a, a warning here about him coming again and being ready for that, but he says that the true follower of Jesus Christ is going to adjust their life to him and take up their cross and follow him. That means a sacrificial uh, way of life. It means following him, not our own way of life or someone else's way of life. We, we make the adjustment to him. And so we take up our cross daily, it says, and follow me. This is not just a, the Christian life is just not a one-time commitment where we repent of our sin and turn to him by faith. That's the starting point. The rest of our life is to be lived in surrender to him. So the big thought of this today is this. We adjust our life so that we can obey God. We adjust our life so that we can obey God. So what are major adjustments required in my life if I'm going to accomplish God's assignment? What happens, though, when I make such adjustments? And what should I expect from God when I pray for something according to His purposes? Adjustments prepare you for obedience to God. You cannot continue life as usual or stay where you are and go with God at the same time. This is true throughout Scripture. Noah could not continue his life as usual and build an ark at the same time. Genesis 6, he had to adjust his life. In fact, his whole family had to adjust their life to God's plan. Abraham could not stay in Ur or Haran where he ended up for a while. His father took them to that particular city. And then Abraham went in obedience to God and began the nation of Israel in Canaan. He had to make incredible adjustments in his life. David had to leave uh, his sheep to become king, 1 Samuel 16. Peter, Andrew, James, and John had to leave their fishing businesses to, to follow Jesus, Matthew 9.9. 9. And then Saul, who became Paul because of his encounter with the living and risen Lord Jesus Christ, had to completely change the direction in his life, theologically, religiously, all of those things, so that he would follow the Lord. But there's a story that still gets me to this day. I've heard it many times, I've read it many times, and it's the rich young ruler, and he refused to adjust to the things of God. He was rich, he was young, he was a ruler. If he had followers, he had a million followers on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook because he, he had that popularity, right? Uh, he was kind of the it guy at the time. But Jesus and him have an encounter. And he basically says to Jesus, 
you know, basically, I, I, I followed every, every good thing. I, I followed the Ten Commandments. I've kept them since I was a boy. He's bragging with pride on what he was. And then Jesus says to him, well, if you're going to follow me, you need to sell everything and come and follow me. The rich young ruler refused to make the necessary adjustment and missed out on experiencing eternal life. He, he basically turned away from Christ as a result. And Jesus says you cannot love God and love money at the same time. Or you, you can maybe insert your own thing there. You can't love this and God at the same time or that and, and love God at the same time. But so many people today face the same struggles. Unfortunately, prosperity and the love of things, of, of the love of something else of this world may tempt them to refuse to adjust their life to God. When we look at the rich young ruler, we see one who did not want to adjust his life and follow Christ. But then there are some great examples of people who do. Elisha is one of them who made the major adjustments in 1 Kings 19. Now, God told Elijah, the prophet, to select Elisha as his replacement, okay? So I always got them mixed up, okay? Because their names are so close, right? So Elijah comes first. He's a prophet of God. He's following the ways of God, but he's getting older, right? He's kind of like the old pastor. It's time for him to go, right? And he's got to find a new prophet, and God calls him to go and find Elisha. Now, Elisha was in the field plowing, right, with 12 yoke of oxen. Can you imagine that? It's like plowing today or harvesting today with 12 combines in the field. That's what the picture is here. And he was successful in what he did. And he chooses to leave his family and his career He's light, he is single, that's very clear from Scripture, to follow God's direction. And you've heard the, the saying, like, burn your bridges behind you. Well, the amazing thing about Elisha is that he burned all his farm equipment and had a barbecue with the 24 oxen and fed all of his family and his community, and he left with Elijah. Sometimes you have to leave the good things to experience the best things that God has for you. So what type of adjustments did people in the Bible make to follow the Lord? Did Jesus have to make adjustments in his life to follow the will of his Father? Yeah, he did. But are you and I willing to make adjustments necessary to follow the Lord? And what will we miss if we do not make those adjustments? I mean, what must we do before we can obey God? Well, we need to make adju adjustments. So where do we need to make adjustments at times? Well, in our circumstances. It could be in our job, our home, our finances, and, and other things that God shows us in the circumstances of life that maybe we're going this way and we're really supposed to be going this way. Or in our relationships. And maybe our, our family is going through a great stress and we've got to make some adjustments to bring God's presence, God's power, God's provision back into our family. Or maybe it's with friends. We have to make some choices about the friends that we have. We know the Bible says that bad company corrupts good character. And, and so we need to understand that even our friends, the choices we make about our friends are important to God. Maybe it's our business associates or others that, that in our neighborhood and other things that have been influencing us more away from the things of God rather than to the person of God. In your commitments, we need to make adjustments. It might be in our family. It might be in our church. It might be our job, our plans, our traditions. We've been so caught up in following religious traditions and, and rituals, we miss out what the, the Word of God really says about something. And as a result, that might mean adjustments in our life or in our actions where God calls us to pray more, seek Him, wait on Him, give, serve, and, and do some things that just please Him rather than pleasing ourselves or in our beliefs about God, His purposes. All of these areas we can make adjustments in so that we obey God. But why does God want us to make these adjustments in our lives? 
Well, it's really about absolute surrender, first of all. I mean, Jesus says here, you know, to take up our cross daily and follow him. That's about surrendering our life to him. We don't like that word surrender in our culture, do we? We'll never raise the white flag of surrender, right? We will just do things our way, uh, no matter what happens. But God says he wants us to surrender daily to him and follow him. Because we can only save our life through surrendering to Jesus Christ. Because that moves us to total dependence on the Lord. That's what surrendering to him does. In John 15, 5, it says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I'm in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And we see this throughout the scriptures. We see this in Isaiah 41, verse 10 where the Lord says to us, so do not fear for I am with you. That sentence right there is such a powerful thing in our culture, that God is with us, even though all the things that are going on within our culture, that God is with us. And he says, do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then again in Isaiah 46 and I don't know about you, but I've been rediscovering the book of Isaiah again during these times. And it's written during difficult times. And there we see God over and over again showing his sovereignty and his greatness. And Isaiah 46 says, remember the, 40, the former things, those of long ago. See, God's path, God's truth is, is still the same today as it was a thousand years ago. We can follow him. Why? Because he says here in verses 9 to 11, I am God, there is no other. And you might be here in the, or even watching online and think you are God, but you're not God. Let's just give that up right away. There is no other. I am God, there is no one like me. God says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey, from a far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. When you think about those words for a few moments and those scriptures, they show us very co completely that we can depend on God to carry out his purposes. But sometimes what we find hard is that we need to wait on the Lord. And too often the enemy or the devil himself has uh, his choice for us. And it's usually the first thing that comes along our way. Isn't it always true? And where we have to wait on him. And, and that's hard for us. But the psalmist writes in Psalm 33, 20, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 37, 34 says, hope in the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are destroyed, you will see it. See, when you and I are making adjustments, the Lord will require us at times just to wait on him. This is not because God cannot keep up with you or that he doesn't know what to do next. On the contrary, waiting develops your dependence on him to experience his best for your life. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who hope or wait patiently in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And you notice where you get the strength to deal with the things you're going through in your life? It's hoping in God, waiting patiently in Him. He's the one who strengthens us. And you may think that waiting on God, you have to be passive or it's an inactive time of some sort. But waiting on the Lord is anything but inactive. While you wait on Him, you pray. You watch the circumstances around you. You ask God to interpret them by revealing the, to you his perspective. You'll also be sharing with other believers. You might even say to one of your friends, you know, I'm really waiting on the Lord with, for, for this. Would you pray with me about this just to help me to wait patiently rather than run ahead of God? And while you wait, we're just to continue doing the last things that God told us to do. And in waiting... 
you and I are shifting the responsibility to, to the outcome to God where it belongs, then when God gives you specific guidance, he will do through you more in days and weeks that you, than what you could accomplish in years of personal labor and personal direction. Waiting on him is always worth the wait. His timing and his ways are always right. And you and I must depend on him to, to guide us in his way and his timing to accomplish his purpose. Some people, though, use waiting on God as an excuse because, well, God's taking too long. I, I've got to do this thing. And God reveals his answer and his action as we patiently wait on him. And many people don't like that. And so they, they, they make quick decisions and, and, and maybe even emotional decisions on something rather than waiting on God, praying and seeking his ways to find his best answer to the situation we're in. In this morning's message, I've tried to help you understand that you cannot stay where you are and go with God in obedience to his will. You need to make significant adjustments that must come first. And to go from your ways, thoughts, and purposes to go to God's will will always require major adjustments first. God may require adjustments in your circumstances. He might require adjustments in your relationships to make it healthier. He might make adjustments in your thinking. You've been thinking this way for a long, long time and there are prejudices and other things that you need to give up and surrender to the Lord. Maybe there's commitments that you need to make or actions that you need to take or beliefs where you're renewed in what the Bible says to do rather than what someone else says to do or what you think might happen. God will change your thinking. Keep in mind that God call, when God calls you, he's also the one who will enable you to do his will. Jim Elliott was a missionary to the Quechua indigenous peoples in South America many years ago. He was willing to give up earthly things to go along with a group of friends to reach out to these tribal people. Jim's famous quote is, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He understood clearly that what he had in Christ, he could not lose. Worldly things, he could lose. But he couldn't lose what he had in Christ. And as a result, he, he went to these people. Unfortunately, Jim was killed by South American natives along with a number of his friends as they sought to spread the gospel to those who had never heard about Jesus before. Later, his wife and others shared the gospel, even with his murderers, many who came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. There was transformation that happened. Bob Pierce's prayer was this, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. Bob Pierce allowed God to adjust his thinking so that he cared about the most needy people in the world, and that was children who were living in poverty. God cares about poor people, children and families, and God used Bob Pierce to establish world vision and also Samaritan's Purse to minister to needy people worldwide, all because he was willing to make adjustments for God in his life, and he obeyed God's call in his life. You and I must make major adjustments in our lives to join God in what he's doing. What will God do through you if you make adjustments in your life? What decisions will he, he do as a result of your obedience to him as you've made these adjustments? What adjustments do you need to make? Make the adjustments and see what God can do through you. Let's pray. Father, as we pray this morning, we're thankful for the principles that we've been learning through this series, Experiencing God. As we pray today, Father, I just ask that you would speak into our hearts and lives, realizing, Lord, to obey you means making adjustments first, and we see this throughout the Scriptures. 
We see those two that don't want to make adjustments. They just reject you. And as a result, there's judgment, Lord, and, and punishment. But when we are people that follow you, you call us to make these adjustments and we see your grace and greater blessing in our lives as we follow you. And we can make such a, an impact in our neighborhoods, our families, our workplaces as a result. I just pray, Father, that wherever we may need to make adjustments in our lives, that we would do it. And then as we come together next week and conclude this series, Lord, we realize that the next step is so important too. So I just pray, Father, that you lead and guide us. And as we sing this song of decision today, I pray, Father, that you would just work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.